Okay. Well, what about quality? Well, quality kind of floats out in the air somewhere. Uh, and actually, I think that's a big mistake of uh, the classic approach because they don't realize that quality is something that you work on. And so, with XP and with Scrum, we have this concept of the definition of done or done done, and that's defining our quality. And so, at the beginning, we can um, we, we we focus our we set a level of quality, and we can actually work to continuously improve that. And that's one of the powers of the agile approach is that we're actually continuously improving our quality. The time gets fixed by the length of the sprint. This doesn't change very often. The cost is simply the number of people in this team times the duration of the sprint. Might be a few other things here, but basically it's that. The quality is the definition of done. The scope is agreed upon between the team and the product owner or the customer's representative. Uh, and so, well, what is that? Yeah, that's not a bit like a fixed price, fixed scope, fixed quality, fixed time project to me. The only thing is, what I, I talk when I, when I train people, I talk about the sprint contract, and this is because my first project was Scrum. It really was a commercial project. I was the, uh, the, cup, the supplier, and my product owner really was the customer, and so the sprint contract really was a contract. But it reminded him to leave us alone. He made an agreement with us, and he had to leave us alone until the end of the sprint unless we wanted something from him. But he couldn't change, he couldn't change his mind about what he wanted, except on a sprint boundary. <coughs> and so this has proved to be a very useful way of thinking about it. Now, the difference between the sprint contract and, say, a commercial contract is that the scope, the team commits to do its best to achieve the scope. And the team makes very transparent whether they achieve the scope or not. And if there are any differences at the end of the sprint, they can, they can communicate that. Um, obviously, if we're talking about the whole project, if there's a fixed scope, there might be commercial, um, commercial contingencies in there or bad things that can happen if, if, you, uh, uh, if you don't fulfill the scope. Um, this does, however, bring an interesting question. Under Scrum or XP, if you have committed to too much scope and you're not going to make it by the end of the sprint, what do you do? Do you do overtime? Do you cut corners on quality? Do you extend the sprint? These three guys, time, cost, and quality, they're all fixed. So what that means is if anything is going to vary, it's going to be the scope. And so now we have our first conflict with the idea of a fixed scope contract, because a fixed scope contract, they try to fix the scope. They haven't really talked about the quality, so what happens? The quality varies. And so you find yourself having very high maintenance costs, because, OK, you push the stuff out, the people work you know, 12 hour days, seven days a week for, you know, the three months before the project, and surprise, surprise, the code is not in very good shape when it gets delivered. Um, so we do have something of a cultural conflict here, and one of the questions which you have when you're selling a fixed price project is, well, how do, how do we manage this conflict? Because we're going to want, if anything varies, we want that to be the scope. And of course the customer is saying, well, I'm fix fixed scope. So, and this is this concept about um, agile and classical thinking differently. By the way, I'm going to post my slides on, the, on my blog, scrumbreakfast.com. So if you look for Scrum Breakfast, uh, the internet access has been kind of flaky today, but uh, certainly by tomorrow I will have it on, on the blog. Um, anyway, if we look at the classical process, they start with their requirements, they generate their list of features, they give it to somebody for an estimate, they say, how much is it going to cost? And they get a price back and they have a heart attack because it's much too expensive. And so then we start, uh, then we start having to haggle over what it's really going to cost. Uh, and then you start implementing. And of course, well, you know, you implement, you implement, you implement, and somewhere about three months before delivery, you realize you have no chance of completing everything that you promised. And so then you start prioritizing to see, to try to get something finished which the customer can use. Uh, and, the Agile world thinks much more actively about business need. And so what you want to clearly have is a vision, the business need, what's the business value. And already on the basis of that, you can define the budget. Okay? And from that, you work down to the, use, to the user needs. You get a wish list, a wish list um, otherwise known as a product backlog, possibly in the form of user stories, preferably in the form of user stories, about what you want, which you can then prioritize. And then you implement this list from top to bottom, prioritized, 
Uh, and basically, every sprint should produce running tests and features. Now, obviously, estimates are bad. So what's going to happen? You're, and you're going to, oh, by the way, you're going to learn things along the way. You're going to learn things along the way. So maybe the things that you think are important now, halfway to the project, won't be quite so important. And so you want to take things out and add new things. Now, by playing the change request game, there is no taking things out. There's only adding new things. With the agile approach, it's possible to swap. So, another call for conflict. No overtime. Why is there no overtime in Agile? Well, the team agrees every sprint how much work they're going to take on. And basically, if the team does overtime this sprint, they're going to have to do overtime next sprint, and overtime the next sprint, and overtime the next sprint. Otherwise, their velocity is going to go down. Wait a minute. Their velocity is, is artificially high at a level they can't maintain. Um, this becomes, this becomes an interesting conflict when I, I actually had a customer which had a tradition of doing fixed price projects and they also had a tradition of getting them done, even if that meant overtime. But if you're six months into the beginning of a project, or six months from the end of a project, and you realize, hey, we've got much too much scope, there's no way we can do this and maintain our quality, then we have um, a conflict between, well, are we going to do overtime for the next six months? How are we going to maintain the quality? And are we going to get the project finished? So, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a bit, now, now that we've seen some of the conflicts involved in doing a fixed price project in Agile, I'd like to talk to you about some strategies for, uh, for accomplishing that. Um, you'll notice I've got a much friendlier picture of the customer in this, uh, in this one, and, and I think one of, the, one of the principal things to do is to develop a good working relationship with the customer. Uh, having a customer who is as committed as you are to achieving the goal of, of uh, staying, staying within the agreed upon price uh, is very, very helpful. And this brings me to the point of the Agile Manifesto. How many people, you've all seen the Agile Manifesto, have you not? Is this, is this new for anybody? Okay. Uh, basically, the things on the left are more important than the things on the right. Uh, what's kind of scary is the number of people who think that the things on the right are unimportant and only the things on the left are important. Okay, this, this is not good. Everything in this table is important. And you'll notice we have contract negotiations. We need contracts. Um, we need to know how we're going to build for our projects. We need to know how the risk is going to be shared or divided between the customer and the supplier. Uh, Contrast can be very helpful or very um, detrimental to the quality of the relationship between the customer and the supplier. And so, you know, when you're negotiating your contracts, look for forms that give you a good working relationship with the customer. Um, I, I'm not actually going to talk about contracts in this talk, but if you're interested, go Google for something like money for nothing changes for free, and that's kind of the best way, or that, that's, that's a very cool way to, to do agile projects with the customer who you don't really know. So, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the problem of managing expectations. And so I have an example for you. This, this is going back to one of my first Scrum projects. I was the Scrum Master. And I had a small problem. My team was in St. Gallen, St. Gallo, and I was in Zurich. 